to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. for this hymn, Savior like a shepherd lead us. Yeah. 
because we've enjoyed every single message up to this point, I have no doubt um, that you're in for a treat. We've been streaming the services to uh, Facebook and uh, linking them to our website, and they've also, uh, as of this week, been going to uh, a YouTube channel. We invite you to, uh, to search that out, to uh, subscribe and, and like and share so that uh, we can spread the, the gospel better among our friends, family, community, and, and, and literally the world, so, hoping to, to reach souls with the gospel. Gary Berdine has uh, uh, singing tonight, and after the opening selection, Charlie Eisenhood is visiting with us from Wellsburg, and he is going to lead the opening prayer. There will be one more selection before Brother Antoine presents the message of the hour. I invite you to join in heartily in song and to enjoy our worship tonight. <coughs> okay, the first song tonight is in Christ alone. It is not in any songbook that's in the pew, but it is on the screen. So we'll be using the screen tonight. So let's join together in singing this great hymn. <coughs> in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my heart.
shall we bow? Our Father and our God who art in heaven, holy and reverend is your name. As we bow before you this evening, Father, would you be so kind and lend an ear unto our prayers. We wish to thank you, Father, for the blessings of this beautiful spring day and for the opportunity we have this evening to meet with your saints to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're mindful, Father, of those who are not as fortunate. We pray, Father, for those who are in the nursing homes and the care of others. We pray, Father, that they would have the things that they need while they continue their sojourn here in this world until the time comes when you call them home. We pray, Father, for those that are recovering from illnesses and diseases and such, that they can regain their health and be able to come back and worship with the saints wherever they may be. We're thankful, Father, that we live in a country that we have the freedom that we do, that we can meet, and our government doesn't molest us. Our prayers, Father, are for those brothers and sisters in foreign lands who is not so fortunate. We pray, Father, that you would accept their worship as they meet from time to time for the best that they can. And pray, Father, that the time will come Perhaps their leaders would realize that your people is not a hindrance to their authority, but would be an asset. Father, as Brother Holloway stands before us this evening and breaks unto us the bread of life, that we'll give him our undivided attention and search the scriptures and see if the things that he teaches is the truth. Father, we're so thankful that you would the love and the compassion and mercy that you had, that you sent your only son to be that sacrificial lamb that was hung upon the cross of Calvary so many years ago. The blood was shed there, Father, that ended all sacrifices, the last and the greatest one. That blood, Father, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Forgive us, Father, of any unpardoned sins that our prayers will be hindered. Father, as we blend our voices together with our song leader, we trust, Father, that you will be pleased with our song service as we sing with the spirit, with the understanding. Use us in your kingdom, Father, where you have need. Bless us when we do your will, rebuke and chastise us, when we err from your way. Hear us in our prayer. Receive our offers of thanksgiving. Grant us our request if it be your will. In Christ our Lord's name, amen. 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 <coughs> this evening, we're going to sing hymn number 261, 261, if you will, please stand for this song. Beautiful. 
Once again, God has seen fit according to his own purpose and grace that we gather together in this assembly to hear and to study another portion of God's holy and divine word. To those of you who are visiting with us and you're not members of Churches of Christ, we just want you to know that here at the Church of Christ, we love to have visitors and we pray that it shows. For there were many places you could have been on a Friday night, but you made the choice to come to the house of God, which is the Church of the Living God, pillar and ground of the truth. Before I begin this evening, I just want to thank the elders of this congregation who thought enough about me and had the confidence in me to come and share with you this week the word of God. I hope these lessons have been edifying to you. I hope that they have pricked the hearts of those that have yet to name the name of Christ. But I do know that your presence in this invitation has truly encouraged me and has given me a shot in the arm. I think one of the reasons why the elders where I'm at don't mind me doing meetings because the Sunday sermon when I return seems to be so much better than the Sunday sermons before gospel meeting. And so I'm just so thankful for the encouragement that you have given me. You attending has been encouraging. So to those that are here tonight, thank you. Those that have traveled from area congregations, you could have been anywhere else, but you chose to be here. So again, I thank you. I especially like to thank those that have thought it not robbery to be here every night. See, I have to be here every night, but you didn't have to be here every night, but you made the sacrifice to be here every night. And I just want you to know that I don't take that lightly and may God reward you according to your works. Uh, to those that are watching us in Facebook and YouTube, thank you for viewing uh, these meetings, these, uh, these messages every evening. I thank you for being a part of this as well. To those that have led prayers, both opening and closing prayers every night and every service, those that have led songs and have set the tone for the messages that are being brought forth each and every evening. I thank you for your labor as well. Uh, to those that have given me kind comments uh, as you were leaving uh, this place every evening, thank you. Uh, I would like to also thank those that have thought enough about me to have me into their homes, to feed me and to entertain me. I thank you. I want you to know that from what I can see this congregation has a brilliant present, but I know that they even have a brighter future because of your well-behaved and spiritually-minded young people that worship here. There are so many congregations that don't have that. And so young people, I just want you to know that you're not the church of tomorrow. You are the church of today. And it is your job to continue to hold the line and carry the torch as you continue to stand on the shoulders of all these men and women that have come before you so that the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ can always be upheld and you can always be a beacon of light in this community as well as throughout this world. And last but not least, I would like to thank the Burdines who've been putting up with me all week, keeping me in their home. Brother Kerry has been my chauffeur, picked me up from the airport, taking me all over West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, bringing me to building ch church every night, bringing me to the church building every night, bringing me to folks' homes every night, and he has to get up and at three in the morning take me back to the airport. And so I hope you all appreciate him. And I appreciate Sister Evelyn. She has just been so kind. She has been quite the conversationalist. I've enjoyed speaking with her. She cooks me breakfast in the morning, tucks me in at night, and so I've had a, an outstanding time staying uh, in their home. Thank you so much. God bless you all. If you have your personal copy of God's Word, please turn with me, if you will, for our final message this evening, which is going to come from the book of Psalm, 
the division is 133, and the verses are 1 through 3. Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. Reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, there you will find these words. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. This week we've been talking about being a people after God's own heart and the very first message that was presented on Sunday dealt with defining what it means to be a person after God's own heart. Why Paul in the very first sermon that he preaches when God separates him and Barnabas to go throughout the Gentile world and preach the gospel, why does he use David as a text of encouragement and evangelism to help the Jewish people come out of error and into the marvelous light of God. And then we had two filler sermons dealing with the life of David, a psalm that he wrote on Sunday evening, looking at Psalm 27, and then looking at a situation in his life in which he learned that he needs to encourage himself in the Lord. And that message was to us that sometimes we have to encourage ourselves in the Lord as we take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 30 verses 1 through 6 and then each night we've looked at the word heart and we have taken the letter from the word heart to deal with a particular subject each and every evening the H in heart was for humility we dealt with that on Monday night the E in heart was for enthusiasm we dealt with that on Tuesday night the A in heart was for authority. We dealt with that on Wednesday night. The R in heart was for repentance. We dealt with that last night. And we're going to conclude this me meeting this evening by dealing with the T in heart. And the T is for togetherness. This is a message about unity. So on, the, on tonight, I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, the need for togetherness the need for togetherness psalm 133 is a psalm that was written by david but it is believed to have been read and sung during the dedication of the rebuilt walls of jerusalem in nehemiah chapter 12. nehemiah and the children of judah had a lot to overcome in the rebuilding of these walls after being freed from Babylonian captivity. Nehemiah prayed for this work. But not only did he pray for this work, he went a step further and he gathered workers. He met opposition to the work. He stopped the oppression of the, of the poor while doing this work. He gave generously to those in need. He even survived the conspiracy and he led the people of God in the confession of their sins. Finally, after all of this, the work was complete because the people of God did something that the people of God must do today. They worked together. When people truly understand the power of unity, when they understand the potency of togetherness, especially brethren, then there is no task too big that we cannot accomplish. My brothers and sisters, unity is strength. When there is teamwork and collaboration, don't you know that wonderful things can be achieved? 
And as a man after God's own heart, David himself had this testimony. And so there's three points that I would like to bring to your attention. And then the lesson is yours to receive. Point number one is going to be David's company. And then we're going to talk about point number two, which is David's congregation. And then finally, we're going to deal with point number three, and that is David's compassion. First, let's deal with David's company. What do I mean by David's company? Well, by company, I am talking about the people with whom we identify. Who is your company? Who are the people that hang around you and you hang around them? Who are the people in your life that you are the closest to? Well, David had a company. He kept company with certain individuals. The first name I want to bring to our attention is a man by the name of Jonathan, because each of these individuals or these group of individuals represents a particular type of person that if we are going to be a people after God's own heart, they must be a part of our company, too. And so, number one, I want to deal with Jonathan. Jonathan was David's best friend. And who Jonathan represents in David's life is people who always have your back. People who always have your back. Yes, we are living in an age in which people have no problem stabbing you in the back. We live in a world today in which people have no problem talking about you. We are living in a world today that just because people are with you, that, that doesn't mean that they are following you. We are even living in a world that just because people are following you doesn't mean that they are with you. I mean, even Jesus had 12 disciples and one was a thief and a betrayer and led to his death on the cross. And so we have to be careful with the people that we allow in our lives. And so Jonathan represents people who will always have your back. People that when you are going through something, they're not there to beat you down. They're there to build you up. People that are going to always support you, a good friend. That they're not going to let anybody else harm you. So Jonathan's father wanted to kill David. Jonathan had a choice to make. Do I side with my father the king or do I have my friends back? And he had his friends back. Everybody needs a Jonathan in their lives. But we also that understand that David didn't just have a Jonathan, but last night we talked about the mighty men. Uriah was named among the mighty men. And guess what? We need some mighty people like the mighty men in our lives. The Bible tells us something in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Listen to your Bible. In Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, the book says, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another see who these mighty people these mighty men represented in David's life was people who make you better David was a better king because of these men being in his life notice David is a giant killer he has defeated Philistines all by himself. So he cannot have people in his circle that he has to always carry, but he needs to have people in his circle that when he is down, they will stand up and carry him. Towards the end of David's life, the Bible tells us a story about how David went into battle and couldn't complete the battle. And it was the mighty men that said, King, you don't have to come out here on the battlefield with us anymore. We got this. David had made them better and they had made David better. 
I tell people all the time, and young people, if you get nothing else out of this message, at least get this. If you are the smartest person among your group of friends, you need to find some new friends. Because you may be making them better, but they're not making you better. And so therefore, you need to be around people that's going to sharpen you, give you something to aspire to, to make you better than what you are. Because we are all more than what we have become, but we will never get there if we're always hanging around people that just make us look good because we tend to be smarter than them or more financially affluent than them or have more to them than them. You need to have people in your life in which you say, all right, maybe I'm not all that in a bag of chips. I need to step my game up. Maybe I need to polish my shoes. Maybe I need to iron my pants. Maybe I do need to read an extra book. Maybe I do need to watch less TV. Maybe I need to talk to people that are going to challenge me intellectually. Maybe I need to be around people that's going to challenge me spiritually. And so you need to be with people in your life that are going to make you better. But not only did David have Jonathan and the mighty men in his company, he also had prophets in his company. There was two prophets in particular that were influential in the life of David. One was a man by the name of Nathan and the other was a man by the name of Gad. And who these prophets, Nathan and Gad, represent in, represented in David's life represents the same in our lives. And that is people who will tell you what you need to know to get right. You don't want people in your circle that feel that every time they're in your presence, they have to walk on eggshells. You need people in your life that when you are wrong, they come to your face and say, yep, you are the man. You messed up. You need to repent. You need to get right with God. I can't tell you how many friendships have ended in the brotherhood because people don't like being told that they're wrong. But if you want to be all that God has called you to be, you need some people in your life that love your soul more than they love your feelings. Amen. Because one thing that I've learned is that, you know, <laughs> God's going to hurt more than your feelings on the day of judgment if you're not right with him. People are, I don't want to say nothing to them because I may hurt their feelings. We've been friends for so long. I don't want to hurt their feelings. No, you need to hurt their feelings if that's what it's going to take for them to get right with God. David wouldn't even be David if there wasn't a Gad and a Nathan in his life that when he was going in the wrong direction, told him he was going in the wrong direction to get him back in the right direction. But we also see that David not only had mighty men, prophets, and Jonathan in his life, but he also had priests, priests that he trusted. The two priests that I have in mind are Ahimelech, and Abiathar. Now the work of the priests were to teach the word of God. And so what does that represent in our lives? It's represented the same in David's life. If the prophets were in his life to tell him what he needed to know to get right, then the priests were in his life to tell him what he needed to know to stay right. See, there's always going to be people in your life that when you fall, they're ready to tell you about yourself. But you need people in your life to keep you from falling. And that's what the priests were there for. And you need people in your life that's going to keep you from falling. That's going to be there by your side. Day in, day out. To strengthen you. To go with you along the way. So that you can be the best version of yourself. My brothers and sisters, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, that's still in the Bible. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. And so if we want to have good morals, then we need to keep good company. 
But if our morals are rotten, then maybe it's because of the company that we keep. So investigate your network. Are there people in your life that will always have your back, that will make you better, that will tell you what you need to do to get right and tell you what you need to do to stay right? Because if you don't have those people in your life, then they will ruin your good morals. But not only did David have company, let's talk about David's congregation. Now, by congregation, I'm talking about what we do when we come together. Because you can have good people in your life, but if you're engaging in the wrong things, then everything that you're doing is in vain. So what do we do when we come together? There's a few verses that I want to keep in mind because these are the things that David did when he came together with those in his company. Psalm 34, verses 1, 2, and 3. In Psalm 34, verses 1, 2, and 3, the Bible reads, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You need to have people in your life that when you come together, you come together to bless the Lord. You come together to praise his name. You come together to celebrate the greatness of of our awesome God, a God that is so awesome that he can do anything except for fail. We need to come together to exalt his glorious name. That's what we do with the people in our company. But not only that, we also see what David says in Psalm 55, verse 14. Psalm 55, and the verse is 14. Hear the words of the psalmist where he says, we used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house, we walked in the throng. What that simply means is David says, when I am with certain people, we come together to learn God's word. So you want to be with people that are not afraid to have the Bible opened in their presence. You need to be with people that will open up the word with you and you will open up the word to them. You need to be with people that will challenge you with what thus saith the Lord as you challenge them with what thus saith the Lord. You need to be around people that will challenge your thinking on many biblical subjects just to make sure that you are sound and you are living the way that God has called you to live, that he has authorized you to live. That's what we do with those that we are supposed to have company with. But not only that, we see Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, a very familiar passage of scripture. The Bible reads, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. My brothers and sisters, when we come together in assemblings like this, when we come together in our first day of the week assembling, then what we are doing and what we ought to be doing is considering one another. One of the reasons, one of the things I've learned about the importance of attendance and the danger of absenteeism is that when a person is absent from the assembly, then they have become an inconvenience because we come together to consider one another. But I can't encourage you and you can't encourage me if we're not here. And so if a person is not here, that person becomes an inconvenience because now I got to stop what I'm doing with people who have done the right thing to go search for people who have chosen not to do the right thing or dare I say, didn't think enough about me to encourage me like I came out here to encourage you. 
And so that's what we're supposed to do when we come together, to consider one another. Our presence is a consideration of those that we say we love and have fellowship with. We come together to provoke one another unto love and good works. That means to push one another into the things that identify us as Christians. Jesus says, you will know my disciples by the way they love one another. So when we come together in assemblies like this, the whole point is to provoke the person next to you unto love and good works. In other words, when we come together, I should leave here wanting to make an impact with the next person I come in contact with. I should want to do a good work by either telling them that they're going in the wrong direction, encourage them, visit somebody, call somebody, help somebody, whatever it may be. You know, Mahalia Jackson had a song. She says, if I could help somebody as I pass along, if I could cheer somebody with a word or song, if I could show somebody that they're traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. If I could bring back beauty to a world uprought, if I could do my duty as a Christian ought, if I could spread love's message as the master taught, then my living shall not be in vain. My brothers and sisters, when we close our eyes for the last time, we don't want to have to stand before Jesus, the one who died on the cross for our sins, having lived an empty, useless, vain life. So when we come together, we're supposed to come together to even encourage one another to prepare for the day of judgment. My grandmother used to always say the reason why we come to worship is because this is nothing but a rehearsal. When we're singing, this is just a rehearsal because when we get to heaven, we're going to really we're going to really sing. So how are you going to get to glory having missed worship services down here? Expect to know what you're supposed to be doing when we get up there. You're not going to get in. You're going to have a gate problem. Because how can you be in a place for all eternity to do the very thing that God has commanded us to do down here, but we got a problem doing it down here, but all of a sudden we're not going to have a problem doing it up there? Heaven is going to be filled with people that love worshiping God. See, we come together for an hour, hour and a half, tonight two hours, because of my sermon. <laughs> but we are limited. By this earthly tabernacle that our souls reside in. And so the reason heaven is going to be so wonderful is because we're going to shed this earthly tabernacle that is being dissolved. And we're going to receive new bodies that's going to be able to keep up with the zeal that we have in our souls to do what we desire to do down here. And that is to praise God forevermore. And so the reason why we come together is to encourage one another to prepare ourselves for that glorious day. And so I want us to understand the dangers of isolation. Because I run into too many people that tell me that, oh, I can learn more if I could just be at home and read the Bible by myself or. Or, or there's too many comments in Bible study. It just messes up my thinking. And I, I just need, if I could just be alone and, and do things on my own, I would be so much happier. I don't need elders watching over me. I don't need that preacher telling me everything I'm doing wrong. I don't need people judging me. They always think about the negative aspects, which don't even exist when your heart and your eyes and your mind is stayed on Jesus. But I want us to see the danger of isolation. Listen to your Bible as we take a look at Proverbs chapter 18, <clears throat> verse 1 and 2. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1 and 2, listen to what the Bible says about people who talk that way. The book says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. 
He breaks out against all sound judgment. Then he goes on to say a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Well, Brother Holloway, I'm no fool. Well, okay, but then don't isolate yourself. Just that simple. Come together. Do what scripture commands of you. Be a person after God's own heart and express the spirit of unity that we see in scripture. And so we talked about David's company. We talked about David's congregation. Let's deal with our third point and talk about David's compassion. Now, when we are talking about David's compassion, we're talking about our commitment to those with whom company we keep and congregate. Our commitment to those with whom company we keep and congregate. Now, there's one person that I have in mind in seeing how David treated people that were a part of his company. And I can only think of one name, and that's the name of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan who was the son of Saul. We read in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, that David wanted to know if there was anyone left in the house of Saul that he could show kindness to. Because David had ample opportunity to kill Saul, he wouldn't do it. Saul saw the humility in David and begged David to show kindness to his family. And David promised to do it. And now since David is on the throne, he intends to keep that promise to show kindness to a young man by the name of Mephibosheth. And the way he shows this kindness is by treating Mephibosheth as if he was one of his own sons. He got to live in the palace. He got to eat and sit at the king's table. Mephibosheth was supposed to be a third generation king. That throne that David is sitting on was supposed to be his throne. And David knows that. But because of the iniquities of his grandfather, it was stripped from him and given to David. And yet David doesn't eliminate the house of Saul. Instead, he shows kindness to this young man. This young man had been made crippled as a result of the Philistines invading Israel. And they were running to try to hide him and they dropped him and he fell and he crippled his legs and was unable to walk the, days, the rest of his life. So David showed kindness to this young man. And so the question is, what kind of kindness, what kind of compassion do we show towards those that are a part of our company? What kind of compassion do we show towards those that we worship with? We see in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, where the Apostle Paul writes, love one another with brotherly affection. And then he says, outdo one another in showing honor. So my brothers and sisters, one of the things that we ought to be practicing when we come together and with those with whom we have fellowship and with those that are a part of our company is that there should be no doubt in their mind of our love for them. But not only that, we see the words of the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, the Bible reads, Put on then, as God chosen ones, Holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to, the, to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Through him. One of the things we learn about love in this text is that love is the band that keeps the new man from becoming the old man again. And so whatever hate we may have in our heart, whatever spirit of unforgiveness we may have, whatever grudge we may hold, may be holding towards somebody that we worship with or somebody that may be in our company, tonight is the night that we need to let it go. You know, Nelson Mandela once said that holding a grudge is like drinking poison, hoping that it would kill your enemy. It makes no sense. Holding a grudge hurts no one except you. Being unforgiving, showing a lack of compassion hurts no one except you. So we need to just simply let it Go, let it go. Be loving, love someone to death, admonish them, teach them. Be thankful to God and help them so that through your goodness and your kindness, just like God's kindness leads us to repentance, your love should be able to lead others to repentance as well. So why do we need unity? Why do we need it as we bring this message to a close? Why? Why do we need unity? Well, that brings us back to our scriptural text of, first, of, of Psalm 133. In Psalm 133, we learn three reasons why we need unity, why we need togetherness. We need unity because it is good. We need unity because it is good. Unity is something that was created by God. Division is something that was created by the devil. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, where the Bible teaches us that God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. God is a God of togetherness. He is a God of unity. Togetherness, not of division. And everything God makes is good. We read the creation account. First day, he made something. At the end, he saw it was good. Day two, he made something, he saw it was good. Day three, he made something, he saw it was good. Day four, he made something, he saw it was good. Day five, he made something, he saw it was good. Day six, he made man in his image and his likeness, and he said, it's not good, it's very good. That's the God we serve, that everything he does, it's not just good, but it's all good. And so he came up with unity, which means that unity is good. A person after God's own heart does all of God's will, and the will of God is good and acceptable. That's what we see in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The second reason why we need unity is because it is pleasant. It is pleasant. A person after God's own heart diligently seeks God. Our faith pleases God and his reward ought to please us. As we see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And then number three, we need unity because it's blessing. Unity blesses. It's blessing is eternal life. Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 says, He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath 
and fury, being patient with brethren who are yet to come to themselves, accomplishes this. Think about the prodigal son and his father. When that boy decided he wanted to take half of his inheritance and go off into a far country, the father didn't stop him. And when that boy lost all his wealth, he lost all his friends. He found himself eating pig slop, hiring himself out in a foreign land. And when he came to himself, he came to the realization that I can go home and I need to go home. And as he was on his way home, the Bible says his father saw him afar off. We don't know how many months, we don't know how many years he was away, but his father was patient. And isn't God patient with us? That when we were out there saying things that we shouldn't have been saying, thinking things we shouldn't have been thinking, doing things that we shouldn't have been doing, that he didn't take us out that day or in the midst of our foolishness, but gave us the space and the time we needed to make things right with him. And if he was patient with us, then we need to be patient with others. So where do you stand on tonight? We're about to sing a song and that song is entitled, What? will your answer be? What will your answer be to what? What will your answer be to the gospel call? What will your answer be after seeing all that Jesus has done for you, all that God has done for you? What are you ready, what are you willing to do for your God? We need to obey the gospel. We need to understand that the plan of salvation is not a church of Christ thing. It is a Bible thing. And the reason why the plan is the plan is because it's the only plan that adequately deals with the sin problem. See, we understand that Jesus came from glory down to earth. And what did he do? He destroyed, he delivered us from the penalty of sin. There was a debt that we owed that we could not pay. So Jesus paid it all on Calvary. And so how do we receive his gift that he is offering? Well, we receive it by first hearing his word. Now, why do we need to hear the gospel? Why do we need to hear the word of God? It's because hearing destroys the ignorance of sin. There are people lost because they don't know they're lost. So if you just simply tell them what thus saith the Lord, then they're no longer ignorant to their state. They now know that Jesus died for them. They now know that they are lost in sin. They now know that there's a place called heaven. They now know that they are going to have to press a dying pillow one day. They now know that they're going to have to give an answer for the life they live. And so that's why we educate people about what thus saith the Lord to destroy the ignorance of sin. You know why we have to believe the word that we have heard? Because it destroys the love of sin. There are people that know they're wrong, but they keep doing it. Why? Because they don't believe that they are wrong. But the only way we can get right is by believing what God has done for us, believing what Jesus has done for us. And once we truly believe what our sins have done to Jesus on that cross, it should cause us to stop loving sin, but it should cause us to hate sin. And that leads us to repentance. You know why we have to repent? Because repentance destroys the practice of sin. There are so many people that are addicted to sin that they know it's wrong, but they keep doing it. Why? Because they haven't truly changed their mind to it. And so that's why we need to repent. That we're going to stop doing things our way, start doing things God's way. But not only do we have to repent, but we have to confess. You know why we have to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Because confession destroys our allegiance to sin. See, it's not real until we vocalize it. 
There are so many people that want to do things in private. Okay, I'm going to stop smoking. And then you don't tell nobody, so therefore no one can hold you accountable. So for your entire life, they still think you're a smoker. They still think you're a drinker. They still think you're a drug addict. Why? Because you have not come up and publicly proclaimed that you don't want to do this no more. This is why we confess Christ, to tell the world that I am no longer interested in following the devil. I accept Jesus. And when you do that openly and publicly, just like at a wedding ceremony, when you hear the groom and the bride make their wedding vows, that means that you are there not just to party, not just to dress up, not just to give gifts, but to be witnesses to the things that they've said so that when they come to your house in the middle of the night saying, I don't know why I married this man. Can I stay here for a couple of months? You need to be able to say to them, no, because I was there on November the 6th, 1999, when you said you're going to be with that guy till death do you part so we can watch a movie. But after the movie, you got to go home and work that out. And that's why we confess Christ. So when someone says, I don't want to be a member of the church no more. I don't want to follow Jesus no more. They're like, yeah, that's not an option because I was there when you said that he was your Lord. And you have to worship him and you have to serve him until he said stop. And I haven't heard him tell you stop. So you keep worshiping. You keep trusting. You keep living for him. We hold each other accountable. And we need to be baptized. You know why we need to be baptized? Because even after we are no longer ignorant of sin, even though we hate sin, even though we've stopped practicing sin, even though we have destroyed our allegiance to sin, we need to be baptized because baptism destroys the status of sin. It takes you from being a child of Satan to being a child of God. It takes you from being a sinner to a saint. It takes you from being someone who is in darkness and translates you into the marvelous light of God. And when you have destroyed the power of sin in your life through obedience to the gospel, you need to remain faithful to the very end. According to Revelation chapter 2 verse 10, you know why? Because when Jesus comes again, just like he came the first time to deliver us from the penalty of sin, when he comes the second time, he's going to deliver us from the presence of sin. Where we will go to a place where there's no more sickness, sorrow, or pain. Where the unrighteous will not be allowed. We will be in the company of all that is holy. And that's why we endure unto, until the very end. And so if you're a Christian on tonight and you have struggled with the things that I've talked about, this is your opportunity this evening to make things right with your God. Let your answer be, yes, I'm going to let go of sin. Yes, I'm going to make things right with you. Yes, I'm going to do better tomorrow. Yes, I'm going to live for you. So wherever you are on tonight, make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand and sing the song that has been selected. Someday you'll stand in the bar on high. Someday your answer will see.
tonight to the elders and the members of this congregation want to extend our deep gratitude to our brother Holloway who has come to be with us this week and has preached the gospel to us in a way that was very easy to understand. I think a lot of us will have things that we want to take home with us from this week. Uh, Ken and Darren said they're getting ideas for sermons from what he's preached. I expect other people may get some ideas besides them. I think one of the things I've got from this meeting is uh, I want to start reading the Psalms a little more carefully. Uh, there have been a lot of Psalms that have been bought up in his lessons that well, I think I could learn something maybe from digging a little deeper into the Psalms. And that's just one of the things that we can do. The invitation song tonight uh, asked the question, what will your answer be? And we didn't have anybody come forward during this meeting, but I know we've got people in this audience that are thinking about their souls. And that there are people that know that they need to obey the gospel, they just haven't decided to do it yet. And I hope you'll change your mind and decide to do it soon. We'll always be ready to help you do that. We want to wish Brother Antoine a safe trip home. He's right, I've got to get up in the middle of the night to take him to the airport uh, to get back to his family, and I'm sure he wants to do that. And we have really, Evan and I have really enjoyed having him in our homes. And thank all of you people that invited him out, because you know what happened? We got to go along every time. It was pretty nice. I'll tell you that right now. Let's close this service out now with a hymn. Number 430. This is one Brother Carl Parsons used to like to lead at the end of meetings. I just want to sing the first verse of it together. And after that, we'll have a closing word of prayer. Take the name of Jesus with you. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and the Lord. It will joy and comfort give you, take it and pray to Precious name, oh my sweet.